to Australia and the rest of the world. Senator Lyons, it being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, congratulations. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Liberal Senator Holly Hughes said yesterday, and I quote, the Liberal Party represents 24 rural and regional seats in the House of Representatives, which makes it the largest party representing rural and regional Australians. How can the minister claim, as she did yesterday, that the National Party is the only one standing up for the regions? The minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much. and I do thank the senator for her question and her casual interest in regional Australia. She pops in and pops out. And, President, in your former role as chair of the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Select Committee, you did see Senator uh, O'Neill pop into basin communities, uh, make some swift promises, scatter some uh, caring words to false hope to irrigators. Thank you, Senator Davey. And waltz out of town Minister, without actually Minister, telling those irrigators Minister, that the Labor Party— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill, on a point of Senator order. I know Senator McKenzie has difficulty hearing No, Senator O'Neill, on a point you. of order. The point of order is relevant. Uh, this is a question of significant import to the people of Australia who deserve an answer to the question Senator that was asked, O'Neill, not a rant from Senator what, McKenzie. What is the point? S Senator O'Neill, there is no point of order. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you. Look, um, and I look forward to spending this question time talking about the needs and interests of rural and regional Australia for as many times as the Labor Party chooses to ask us a question. It's actually nice to have the Labor Party asking the government questions about rural and regional Australia. Minister, and Minister please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher. Point of order, uh, Mr President. Uh, but, direct relevance to the question. Um, question time shouldn't be an opportunity for ministers to just rant about the opposition. They should be directly relevant to the question they've asked, which is about the regions and it's about the regions and regional liberal representation of those regions, not the Labor Party. Yeah, S Senator Gallagher, you've had a chance to bring the minister's attention back to the question. Minister, uh, I, I, I accept that it's a, a general question in nature in that it involves regional Australia. However, I will ask you to direct your attention to the question. Minister. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President. The National Party and the country party before it has one, one goal, Order. one constituency. Other political parties in this House, in this chamber, represent Order. a raft On my of constituencies. Left. Order. But I can tell this chamber very, very proudly we don't seek Senator to represent Keneally. the needs and interests Senator of Wool and the Loo. And it's great that uh, my Senate colleague Holly Hughes from uh, from Sydney uh, is very, very keen to uh, Minister, talk about the needs Minister, and interests of. Minister, could you please resume your seat? Those on my left, interjections are always disorderly. I cannot hear the minister. Minister, you have the call. Thank you. And so, we only have one mandate. One mandate. And it is to stand up for the needs of rural and regional Australia. It's, we've been doing it for a century. We're very proud to do that because it allows us not to be distracted by other interests, by other constituencies. And the big parties, fairly, you know, have a range of constituencies that they have to manage, as, as the Labor Party. And unfortunately, not enough of the Labor Party MPs and senators Senator give Wong. a damn about regional Australia. You see it in your policies. You Minister, see it in your public. The time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Order. Order. <laughs> Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill, resume your seat, please. This is generally considered a time for the opposition. I would prefer not to waste that time. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Very much, Mr President. Now, Senator Hughes also said, and I quote, it is a mis misnomer to assume it's only the National Party.
that represents the voice of rural and regional Australians. Is Senator Hughes wrong? Minister. Well, I'll reiterate it again, Senator O'Neill. The Labor Party, uh, the Labor Party has members from rural and regional Australia. Uh, the Liberal Party has great members that represent rural and regional Australia. Uh, several of Order. them made comments this week, and I refer to Tony Passon's public commentary, uh, Rick Wilson's public con commentary, Rowan Ramsey's public commentary, great uh, Melissa um, Price from uh, Durack in WA, really strong representatives from rural and regional Australia. But when you ask what my job is as a, uh, the leader of the National Party in this place and what every single National Party senator cares about, we only have one Order. focus, we only have one constituency, we're not distracted by anything else other than the needs and interests of rural and regional Australia. And we're very, very comfortable to fulfil that role. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Has the minister told her 24 regional and rural Liberal colleagues what she really thinks of them? Senator Mackenzie. Love to all the rural and regional MPs in the coalition, because because when we come into this place, and Order Senator Wong's on earlier contribution left. to the Senate, she spoke about targets and quotas, and I've been on the public record. I want to see a cabinet and a parliament full of as many rural and regional MPs and senators as possible, because. Rural and regional people, the most marginalised in this country, the poorest in Minister, this country, Senator McKenzie, need strong representation. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. I, I hardly think it can possibly be directly relevant to refer to a two-minute two statement I gave about women in the context of a question in question time about regional representation. Uh, on the point of order, Senator Canavan. Uh, uh, Mr. President, with all respect, that is not a point of order at all. That is absolutely a debating point that the minister has every right to raise in this place in the context of the answer she is giving. I, I believe the minister was discussing regional and re rural representation in the parliament, and her answer was directly relevant. Minister Mackenzie, did you have anything further to add? Uh, I've got 30 more seconds to extol the benefits of being a rural and regional MP in a very successful and strong coalition that has delivered for rural and regional Australia for a decade. And I mentioned, I mentioned some of my Liberal colleagues who are very proud, strong advocates for the regions, who joined with the National Party who joined with the National Party when this place was discussing climate change policy at another time, at another time, and they actually stood up against the Labor Party. Senator Mackenzie, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President, and it does feel good to say that. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia's COVID-19 vaccination rollout Order. is supporting our national plan to safely reopen the country, and further, how Australia's Order. vaccination rates compare with other countries around the world? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Small for his question. As a proud West Australian, I can understand him being very interested in Vaccination rates, Mr. President. Uh, by the end of today, Mr. President, we will have administered over 33 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine to Australians. Or Australia's COVID-19 vaccination program has conti continued to accelerate, as we said it would. Mr. President, in the last month, over 7.8 million doses of vaccine have gone into the arms of Australians around the country, and we thank each and every Australian for rolling up their sleeves to get the jab. Mr President, I am delighted to report that 85.1 per cent of the population aged over 16 are now protected against COVID-19 with at least one dose, and Mr President, 69.2 per cent of the population over the age of 
We've in fact passed them, Senator, if you've been keeping notice. We've actually even passed Israel, which you try to quote in the chamber. Mr President, as these numbers show, Australians recognise that vaccination is the best way to protect themselves, Order. their loved ones and their country, Mr President. Mr President, in the context of cases this year versus last year and the impacts that we've seen, um, Mr President, last year there were 28,424 cases of the virus in Australia, 2,051 of those in aged care. This year there's been 118,000. 851 cases, 681 of those in aged care, Mr. President. The difference, Mr. President, between this year and last year is vaccination. Mr. President, the message is very clear. The vaccines work, and the message to Australian, Australians is get vaccinated. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what this Liberal National Government is doing to protect younger members of the Australian community? Senator Watt. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and very proudly, Senator Watt, very proudly. Order. Mr. President, I'm very happy to report that the vaccination rollout continues strongly for 12 to 15-year-olds. In just over a month, 59.6 per cent of 12 to 15-year-olds have been vaccinated with a first dose, and 23.7 per cent, Mr. President, have been vaccinated with their second dose, fully vaccinated. Mr President, that is an extraordinary effort. And I thank all of them, their families, for again jumping on board, rolling up their sleeves to protect themselves and their communities in this pandemic. Mr President, as for the five to 11-year-old age group, Australia's medical regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, has provided provisional determination which allows for Pfizer to submit its application for five to 11-year-olds. As soon as that data is received, it will be assessed. Senator Small, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what other measures is this government uh, considering, including new treatments, in order to, present, to, sorry, to treat presentations of COVID-19? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. The government continues to work to support Australians in the fight against COVID-19, including with additional treatments. In recent times, we've secured access to two additional treatments, Mr President. Under a new agreement with Roche Products, Australia will be supplied with 15,000 doses of the COVID-19 antibody-based therapy, Ronaprev. Ronaprev is expected to be targeted for use in unvaccinated people who are at risk of developing severe disease. In addition, the Australian government has secured access to 500,000 treatment courses of Pfizer's COVID-19 oral antiviral drug. Mr. President. This treatment is still undergoing clinical trials. Uh, it is expected to help reduce the severity or onset of illness and expected to be available Mr. President, next year. As the Australian, uh, Australia has also secured an advance purchase agreement for 300,000 courses of the promising COVID, Senator oral Colbeck, COVID-19 treatment The time treatment your for answer has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Mr Morrison said yesterday in House Question Time, and I quote, the government's decision on the government's commitments for Australia in relation to COP26 will be made by the government in Cabinet. When was the Deputy Prime Minister first told by Mr Morrison that he intends to move ahead with net zero by 2050 with or without the support of the Nationals Party Room? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and thank you very much for your question. Well, as has been made very clear by the Deputy Prime Minister and by the National Party MPs and Senators, uh, we are going through our own internal processes to assess uh, any commitment by the government towards net zero 2050, and in a, in a respectful, calm manner, we shall uh, make those views known to the Prime Minister. And Barnaby Joyce is in those discussions as we speak. And so, you know, I think for anyone to cause us to rush that decision 
to actually force our hand when the momentous nature of this decision and the far-reaching impacts of this decision on the people we were sent here to represent haven't properly been assessed is us not doing our job. Us not doing our job. Well, it's not just us. I'll take that interjection from Senator O'Neill. It's not O'Neill, it's not just us. I have some quotes here. There are a couple of Labor MPs who are from the regions. Joel Fitzgibbon, a fantastic, a fantastic uh, member for Hunter, who has uh, been Senator on the record McKenzie. for very Senator McKenzie. Oh. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Watt on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I would have been on my feet a lot more quickly if it wasn't for that cord. Um, <laughs> Don't get tangled on up, relevance. Senator on relevance, uh, it's not about the process the government's going through. Very specific question as to when the deputy prime minister was first told by Mr. Morrison uh, that he intends to move ahead with or without the support of the National Party room. That's the question, not anything else. We'd ask that Sen we get a relevant Wong. answer. Uh, Sen Sen Senator Wong, please allow me to rule. Um, Senator Mackenzie has been directly relevant to the question. However, I detect. You may be straying from that, Senator Mackenzie. However, the bulk of her answer up until now has clearly been directly relevant. So I will remind Senator Mackenzie of the question and ask her not to stray from it. But uh, you have the call. Senator Mackenzie. <laughs> Don't stray. Um, thank you, Mr President. Well, as I said, the National Party has been very clear what we're doing this week. We're making sure that rural and regional jobs will be protected, that we can ensure that any move towards net zero 2050 will uh, ensure that the impacts won't be borne by the people that have sent us to Order. Parliament. It's actually the On very essence left. of democracy. And if those opposite actually remembered who they supposedly Senator represent, Watt. the blue singlet workers in this country, the foresters, the manufacturers, the miners, I tell you what, there's only two people in your political party who are actually sticking up for those workers, and it's Joel Fitzgibbon Senator and Meryl Swanston. Senator Mackenzie, your yeah. time has expired. The Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Mr Joyce has said, and I quote, it is correct that a decision of Cabinet is not a decision that comes to a vote or has anybody crossing the floor. Has the Deputy Prime Minister informed his party room that the Morrison-Joyce government's position of net zero emissions by 2050 will be determined regardless of their views? Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. For 75 years, Two political parties have come together to form a very, very strong Order. coalition, which has delivered stable, successful government more often than not. Uh, well, you know what? You say that, Senator but it's McAllister. a long time since you've been here. It's a long time since you've been here, and it's because the Liberal Party focuses on what they do best, and the National Party focuses on what we do best, which is standing up for rural and regional Australia. And that is actually what we're doing here today. And because of that 75 years and indeed nearly the last decade, we have seen record growth in our mineral exports. We've seen record growth in our agricultural exports. Job booms in both these industries. And we've seen a 20 per cent decrease in our emissions. Without your ETS, without your carbon tax, we've been Driving down emissions and growing the time jobs. For the answer has expired. Senator Walsh, a second supplementary question. Senator Canavan has said, and I quote, perhaps a decision has already been made by reports in the media. It seems like the Prime Minister is gaslighting the joint party room. Does the Deputy Prime Minister think Senator Canavan is right when he says Mr Morrison is gaslighting? Senator Mackenzie. Well, OK. Matt, you've had your chance. Um, I'm answering on your behalf. Um, look, I think, I think obviously every successful partnership in life uh, has to be a respectful one. And I think we know in the coalition that it's uh, been a strong relationship. We need to be unified. We're best when we're unified. But we don't always agree. And this actually is one of those... Uh, points where we have Senator to Rez. assess 
the information in front of us and come to a considered position. Like people shouldn't be surprised about this. It is not about Albo waltzing into the Labor Party caucus and saying, OK, I've done the deal. The left says this. The New South Wales right says that. Uh, the Victorian left says this. Kim Carr says something else. And this is going to be our position on this particular policy decision. No. There are two independent parties Senator here. McKenzie, and it may be the time uncomfortable. For the answer has expired, and I will remind all senators that we should revert to those from the other place by their correct titles. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Congratulations on your appointment. Uh, my question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. The EU ambassador has warned that Australia may face carbon tariffs if Mr Morrison doesn't stump up to Glasgow with strong 2030 targets, the target that actually matters. What guarantees can you provide that the Prime Minister won't walk into Glasgow with empty hands on the crucial 2030 target and therefore come home carrying in his luggage carbon tariffs from our major trading partners? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. Indeed, uh, Mr President, I'm very happy to provide guarantees that the Prime Minister, as he's indicated, will travel to Glasgow. He will outline the extent to which Australia has made commitments in the past, met and exceeded our commitments in the past across the Kyoto Protocol, first commitment period and second commitment period. He will outline how, in relation uh, to the Paris Agreement, Australia is meeting and on track to beat our 2030 targets, indeed demonstrating that, once again as a country, we don't just talk about these things. When we make a commitment, we deliver on it, and we deliver on it in ways that actually exceed those expectations. And of course, our commitments that we've done to date have seen our emissions fall faster than Canada or Japan or New Zealand or the United States. So, we can demonstrate very clearly that we have made commitments, that our commitments are delivering and that our commitments indeed are exceeding. And our delivery is exceeding many of those around the rest of the world. But importantly, the Prime Minister won't just be going to Glasgow talking about our commitments for the future. He'll also be going talking about our plans on how we deliver those commitments, our plans on how we deliver them in terms of continuing to reduce those emissions in ways that have led and exceeded so much of the rest of the world to date, and our plans on how we will protect the jobs in Australian communities on that journey. Because that is something that is all too often overlooked from those in the Greens and those opposite who want to make the commitment first and worry about the job impacts after. On this side, the Liberal Party and the National Order. Party working together are seeking to address all of those issues concurrently, ensuring that we are best placed to keep reducing emissions while continuing to grow our economy, while continuing to protect and support jobs in regional communities around Australia. That's what we've done through the last few years, and that's what we'll Senator continue to do successfully. Birmingham, your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, while the minister was answering this question, we had the leader of the National Party yell out, "Who cares?" In relation to what the EU is saying and doing, could the minister please explain whether the Prime Minister cares what the EU is saying and what the rest of the world requires and expects when he goes to Glasgow? Senator Birmingham. Well, there's many things, Mr. President, that the Prime Minister cares about. He cares first and foremost about Australians, their safety, their security, their jobs, their economic prosperity. That's why the work we're doing as a government is putting all of those interests first. We're putting those interests first of Australians first by ensuring that we follow through on our emissions reductions commitments as part of our global engagement on climate change. We're putting those interests of Australians first by ensuring that we do that in ways that back technolo technological change, that back the development of things that will drive emissions down while protecting the jobs of Australians. We're putting the interests of Australians first by ensuring that we have a strong story to tell the rest of the world in terms of our emissions reductions, but the investment opportunities in Australia in terms of continuing to achieve those changes 
be they in areas of hydrogen or other areas of technological change that will enable us to beat that into the future. And we look forward to our European friends and other global friends being partners Senator as Birmingham, they are in that journey. Time to answer the question has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary. Th thank you, Mr. President. If you don't have a plan to get out of coal and gas, you don't have a plan to reduce pollution and stop climate change. Last month, the Environment Minister approved four new coal mines. There are 72 new coal mines on the government's books and 44 new, coal, new, new gas projects. How will the Prime Minister explain this when he gets to Glasgow? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Australia's domestic energy market has undergone amazing transformation, and that transformation of Australia's domestic emissions market sees us as having the world's highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world, sees us as seeing uh, us having huge investment in terms of those renewable sectors, and underpinned indeed by our investment in Snowy 2.0 and the Battery of the Nation project. The types of projects Senator Hanson Young is asking about largely fuel the energy demands of other countries, of other nations. Now, as those nations make transition, which many of them are committing to do so, we will see a transition in terms of the demand for energy. That's why we are seeking to invest and to make sure we can attract those international partners, like the agreements we've signed with Japan or Korea or Germany or Singapore in relation to cooperation on new energy opportunities for the future. That's about backing those partners who may, as part of their transition, continue to draw on some of those resources projects from Australia, but we want to make sure that if they transition, when they transition, we have the alternatives in place the to work with them as well. Expired. We now go to the remote. Hopefully, Senator Griff, you have the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister of Health, and relates to tobacco control and non-nicotine vaping products. Minister, non-nicotine e-cigarettes are not therapeutic goods and as such do not come to, under the purview of the TGA. They are classed as consumer goods. Now, new Australian research from uh, Curtin University shows that flavourings and other additives in so-called nicotine-free e-cigarettes are harmful and include cancer-causing substances, pesticides, heavy metals, and even the addition of nicotine in many instances. Does government hold concern over the fact that these easily available consumer products are toxic and potentially carcinogenic particularly given the take-up of these products by teenagers. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Griff, for the question. Uh, the government remains vigilant to uh, the development and the emerging tobacco uh, non-tobacco devices that oh. have potential to normalise smoking behaviours amongst children, young adults, and where the risk of harm such products um, are not yet fully understood or known. The, these products, the non-nicotine products, as you've indicated, is not regulated uh, through the health system but is regulated by the Australian Industrial Chemicals Introduction Scheme, ACUS, or what used to be known as NICNAS, uh, and categorises their introduction into one of five categories. And uh, I can refer you to the industrial um, the, the ACUS website for the information on non-nicotine liquids for vaping devices on their website, Mr President. Um, the regulation of domestic sale and supply of non-nicotine vaping products and devices is in fact regulated by states and territories under their respective tobacco laws and regulations. Uh, in Western Australia, for example, products that resemble tobacco products, including e-cigarette devices, whether or not they contain nicotine, cannot be sold by tobacco or general retailers, Mr President. Senator Griff, a supplementary question? Minister, vaping in school-aged teens is a well-recognised problem, and the research has shown that both nicotine and non-nicotine vapes can act as a gateway to tobacco use. What assistance is the federal government offering the states, or are you aware of any plans to offer the states assistance uh, to actually tackle this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the, the Commonwealth Government continues to work with the states with respect to uh, tobacco and non-tobacco control measures. Obviously, uh, the, the Australian Industrials Chemical Introduction Scheme is a combination of what was formerly state and territory uh, regulatory frameworks into a national one. Uh, 
Uh, and so in that context we continue to uh, work with the states. We uh, acknowledge the research that's recently been done by the Lung Foundation of Australia uh, and Mindaroo, which tested the ingredients and toxicity of 52 e-liquids for sale over the counter in Australia uh, in both their origin and vape form, uh, which found that 100% uh, of e-liquids had between 1 and 18 chemicals to have unknown effects on respiratory health. So we continue to work closely with the states and territories in the regulation of this matter. Senator Griff, a second supplementary question? Uh, thank you, Minister, but I can gather from your answer that the Commonwealth isn't working uh, with the states in relation to uh, the issue with school-aged teens, but perhaps we'll, we'll discuss that uh, uh, separately. Does the government consider it as time to reinvigorate its anti-tobacco campaigns, which have historically helped Australians drive down smoking rates to some of the best in the world? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, can I acknowledge that uh, the campaigns that have been run over many years have in fact achieved the results uh, that uh, Senator Griff has indicated? Uh, the, a strong and continued message, uh, one that is appropriately targeted, particularly into those communities, young Australians and those communities where we still see um, unacceptably high rates of uh, smoking but also use of some of these new technologies uh, is something that we can need to continue to work with both states and territories uh, and at a Commonwealth, Commonwealth level with to ensure that people understand the harms. Uh, the research that's recently been published that I mentioned by the Lung Foundation, Lung Foundation uh, provides some um, level of alertness to that, but communicating that information and continuing the program to uh, encourage people to give up smoking and these other technologies, one that we need, need to continue to work on. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator McKenzie. The Cabinet Handbook requires members of Cabinet to observe Cabinet solidari solidarity. Does Cabinet solidarity extend to this Minister and Nationals members of Cabinet publicly campaigning against Mr Morrison's stated intention to adopt net zero by 2050. The Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Keneally for the question. As the Prime Minister has made clear, this is a decision for Cabinet, and no decision has been made. And so that is as it stands. Uh, every Cabinet Minister in the Senate is aware of the processes of Cabinet and of the Cabinet Handbook and of our responsibilities as Cabinet Ministers in this government. And it has been an incredibly collegiate Cabinet that's been able to deliver for rural and regional Australia. My question though is, I guess, and having dealt with that question, I am very, very happy to go to the fact that Labor Party, and your question um, belies your strategy, that you're all politics and Senator, no— Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Thank you. My question is direct relevance. The minister, by her own answer, is admitting that she is straying into areas that are not relevant to this rather tightly worded question. Uh, President, uh, minister? Uh, Senator, Senator Keneally was asking quite a politicised question. In, uh, in, the way in, which, uh, in the way in which she presented it. Uh, in terms of there being any substance to the question, Senator McKenzie has directly addressed the substance of the question in relation to uh, knowledge of the Cabinet uh, rules and processes. Uh, and, uh, and Senator McKenzie, having directly addressed the question, is fully entitled to add context to the answer she has given. Uh, Senator McKenzie, uh, uh, I believe you were being directly relevant to the question. However, your choice of phrase in broadening your answer was probably not uh, uh, indicating that you were staying directly relevant to the question. So I will bring your attention back to the question. However, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr President. And having answered Senator Keneally's question, I want to go to other aspects of her question, being around the decision on the issue that we're discussing today becoming before Cabinet. 
The Labor Party chooses to politicise their questions to me all day yesterday, all day today. It's the quotathon. We'll pull, you know, we'll have George Christensen, I'm sure, at some point today. Uh, others tomorrow. The fact is that you are playing politics with this question because you actually have no plan. You actually have no plan yourselves to take forward. You have had eight different positions on this question. Eight. Eight. And, and you know, whether it's Chris Bowen, whether it's Mark Butler, whether it's a fantastic member for Hunter, who sadly won't be running at the next election, uh, provides an opportunity for this side of the chamber, quite frankly, uh, Meryl Swanson and the like. You are much more divided on this question going forward than we ever have been. The National Party is focused Senator on McKenzie, its job. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime Minister has made clear that net zero emissions by 2050 will be a decision of Cabinet. Given the Cabinet handbook requires that, and I quote, members of Cabinet must publicly support all government decisions made in Cabinet even if they do not agree with them, does this Minister commit to supporting the Liberal plan for net zero emissions by 2050 once it is adopted by Cabinet? Senator McKenzie. Uh, I completely reject the many assumptions that and presumptions that exist in Senator Keneally's question. As I've just said, as I've just said, the Cabinet has not made a decision. Order, and the Prime Senator Minister Watt. has been clear about that, as is the Deputy Prime Minister. And they are making sure that the National Party has a chance as an independent sovereign party to make their own decision. And we will go through a process that we've outlined. As I've stated, though, you know, this tacky, tawdry political game that you're choosing to play because you don't have a plan. You're not standing up saying what you think should be taken to Glasgow, what you think the 2030 target should be, what you, which is why the Greens chose to try and wedge you this morning. I just want to read from Paul Kelly's triumph and demise, the broken promise of a Labor generation. <laughs> Senator McKenzie, it's your, time absolutely has expired. your time has expired, Senator McKenzie. And, and, and I don't think question time, you can't have the length of answer required to uh, read quotes from a book. Senator Keneally, Thank you, you have a second supplementary. The Cabinet Handbook also states that, and I quote, Cabinet ministers cannot disassociate themselves from or repudiate the decisions of their Cabinet colleagues unless they resign from Cabinet. Given this minister's stated opposition to the Liberals' plan for net zero emissions by 2050, will this minister resign from Cabinet once it is adopted by Cabinet? Senator McKenzie. That is an absolutely a hypothetical uh, question there, Senator Keneally. I've been very clear on what the process that has been outlined by the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister are. So I'll return to what former Nationals leader Warren Truss had to say when the Rudd Labor government put the ETS before this situation. Your climate policy he said— Senator McKenzie, the ETS Senator McKenzie, oh. resume your seat. Senator Watt on a on Senator, how is this Senator, possibly Senator relevant Watt on a point of order? Yeah, on relevance. How is quoting from a book about the Rudd Gala argument possibly relevant to a question about the Cabinet handbook? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President. Order, order. I haven't finished. Uh, I haven't finished. He did sit down. Senator Watt, to be fair, Mr. you did I haven't sit finished. down. Mr. President, I would submit that ministers are flagrantly abusing the privileges of senators in here and are testing your limits as the new president, and I'd ask you to Sen make sure that their answers are relevant. Senator Watt, I have heard your point of order. I have another submission, I assume, on the point of order, Senator Birmingham? On, on the point of order, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, the question was a question that went to matters of Cabinet convention and processes, which are, of course, indeed very long-standing customs and practices. Uh, I am not aware of the content of the quote that Senator McKenzie is going to use yet, and uh, uh, unless Senator Watt has powers that I've not yet seen, uh, nor is he. So it's entirely possible that the quote 
is indeed relevant to matters of cabinet process and cabinet consideration, which would make it directly relevant to the question that was asked. I, Senator McKenzie, I, I believe that Senator Watt may have a point of order, but as Senator Birmingham has, has, ugh, Senator Birmingham has pointed out, without knowing the content of your question, I would caution you against reading something that is not relevant. Senator McKenzie, you have the call. Um, I was asked this uh, in my capacity as a cabinet minister, and so I am quoting a former National Party cabinet minister and deputy prime minister, who, when considering this exact issue under the Rudd Labor government in the shadow cabinet, said that the Labor Party's climate policy was a job-destroying rabid dog Senator, that should be put Senator down. McKen no, I, Senator McKenzie. Uh, um, unless you want to return to the question, I'm going to ask you to stop reading from the book. So do I'll sit there, but I'll, S I'll agree McKenzie to your ruling, Senator Mr. McKenzie. President. Senator McKenzie, Senator McKenzie, you have the call. You have 19 seconds remaining, if you wish to take it. Senator McKenzie. Look, I, I'm very proud to be leader of a Senate team that doesn't shy away from having the tough conversations. Too many people in this place don't stand up for the people that sent them here. Ask the foresters, ask the CFMU, ask Michael O'Connor, who McKenzie, actually stands up for their Senator jobs McKenzie, and it's not you. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you and congratulations, Mr President. My question is to the Attorney-General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General update the Senate how, Liberal and Nationals, how the Liberal and Nationals government is equipping our law enforcement and security agencies with the resources they need to keep Australians safe from violent extremism? The Attorney General, Minister, uh, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I also offer you my congratulations on the election to your new role. Uh, I also acknowledge Senator Patterson's role as the head of the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, and in answering this question, I also acknowledge the recent death of the UK Conservative MP Sir David Amos in a terrorist attack. Mr. President, without a doubt, a fundamental responsibility of the coalition government is to keep Australia and Australians safe to protect our way of life, our freedoms and our values. Our government will continue to combat and keep Australians safe from terrorism and from violent extremism, regardless of the ideology behind it. We may be in the middle, as we know, of a global pandemic, but the threat of terrorism it remains in Australia as it does around the world. Since the national terrorism threat was raised to probable, in September 2014, there have been nine attacks and 21 major disruption operations in response to imminent attacks that were being planned on Australians. There have been 143 people now charged as a result of 70 counter-terrorism operations since 2014, and there are currently 29 people before the courts for terrorism-related offences. To respond to these threats, the government has now passed 25 tranches of national security legislation. As I said, a fundamental responsibility of the coalition government is to keep Australia and Australians safe. The legislation that we have passed is helping provide security agencies with the tools and the legal framework that is necessary to protect Australia, but also to combat new attempts and methods of violent extremism. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the increased investment from the government in our law enforcement and security agencies helping to keep Australia and Australians safe from emerging threats? Attorney General. Well, Mr. President, in terms of emerging threats, the digital world is now the new frontier that organised crime, terrorist, and state sponsored actors are using to threaten Australia and to threaten our way of life. The government is investing almost $1.7 billion through our cyber security strategy to position Australia to meet these evolving threats and to improve capabilities to identify and disrupt cyber security threats. In April of this year, the Foreign Minister 
released the International Cyber and Critical Technology Engagement Strategy to ensure we can develop global cyber resilience and tackle issues of cross-border cyber threats that are growing in both intensity and in frequency. By working, as the Foreign Minister knows, with our national partners and investing in our own capabilities, we can work to both minimise and disrupt cyber security threats by these organisations. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the AUKUS trilateral agreement help our law enforcement and security agencies deepen cooperation with our security partners to protect Australians and our way of life? Attorney General. Well, Mr President, the AUKUS partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the USA builds on our nation's close ties, but it will also enable us to deepen cooperation on a range of emerging security matters. AUKUS will build on Australia's already significant network of international partnerships, including with ASEAN, our Pacific family, the Five Eyes, the Quad and other like-minded partners within our region. This, in turn, will help our security and law enforcement agencies to develop and enhance our capabilities, initially in cyber security, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies. Mr President, by partnering with our allies, we can continue to protect Australians and our way of life through continuing prosperity and security in our region and by ensuring our agencies are at the forefront of new technology. Again, our fundamental priority is keeping Australia and Australians safe. Now we go to Senator Lambie on the remote. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President, and congratulations. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. When the Prime Minister shut down the country in March 2020, he promised Australians that he would use the time wisely and get, and get ourselves ready before we had an outbreak. He told us we would make sure our hospital systems could cope with COVID before it Senator Lambie, I'm afraid you've just dropped out on us. Can you hear me? Into Tasmanian hospitals to make sure that they are safe for us. Senator Lambie, and, Senator and are Lambie. ready so we can reopen the state. Senator Lambie, can you hear me? Yeah. Senator Lambie, can you hear me? All right, we'll move on to the next question and come back to Senator Lambie with the agreement of the chamber. So we'll go to Senator Gallagher. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. sorry, Mr. President, I can hardly hear you breaking up. Uh, so sorry, you, Senator, Senator Lambie. Lambie. We've we've moved on to the next question. Unless we've got a better line now. No, we'll have to. Senator Lambie, if you can hear me, could you disconnect and reconnect? All right, Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, Senator of Birmingham. How much will taxpayers have to pay for Mr Morrison's deal to get the National Party to agree to net zero by 2050? Uh, uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Mr President, uh, this question is almost identical to the question that Senator Gallagher asked me yesterday. And, uh, and indeed, I, uh, I will happily uh, refer uh, to the answer I gave yesterday uh, and the fact that uh, what this government will do is make sure that we invest, as we have done successfully uh, since our election in 2013, to reduce emissions for the nation, which have been reducing uh, at rates far in excess of many other nations around the world uh, and have reduced since 2005, as I said before, in excess of countries like Canada or Germany uh, or the United States or New Zealand. Oh, we'll no. also do so through investments in a way uh, that support transition in regional communities uh, and particularly confronting as we do the changed global environment in terms of changes in our commodities markets, changes in investment markets uh, as other parts of the world make their decisions in relation to net zero. We see an even heightened importance in relation to backing and supporting Australian communities who will be impacted by those change decisions happening overseas but also who face, in some cases, opportunities created by those changing environments overseas. So we'll be investing to back those communities, make no bones about it, as we have all along. And indeed, our investments all along have achieved the types of outcomes of reducing emissions 
without the type of costs that those opposite in the alternative policy regime sought to place on those communities. Our approach of backing technology and incentives to drive investment towards emissions reduction is achieving outcomes without the higher taxes on electricity costs, without Order. the higher costs that hurt jobs and growth across the Australian economy. That was the formula of the Labor Party and those opposite. Uh, we have taken a different approach, and despite the fact that we were told time and time again by those opposite that our approach wouldn't see Order. emissions go down, Order emissions have gone left. down, emissions have gone Senator down, Wong. so have electricity prices. They have gone Senator down, Wong. and jobs have gone up. And that's the trifecta that Senator we intend Wong. to continue to invest and support. Minister, your time has expired. I did miss the Senator Wong. I did miss the clock because there was so much interjecting happening from my left. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of any upper limit on the amount of taxpayer dollars Mr Morrison is willing to spend to secure an agreement with the National Party on net zero emissions by 2050? Is there an upper limit? Minister Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the first thing I'd observe is there was no limit on how much those opposite were happy to tax. There was no limit in terms of their willingness. But what we will do, as we have demonstrated on our track record, is we will target investment to drive emissions down and to protect jobs. We'll target investment to drive emissions down and to keep electricity prices lower. We'll target investment to make sure that we drive emissions down and create new investment Minister, opportunities. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr President. Uh, the question was very tightly worded, and it, looks to, it asks whether the, fin the Finance Minister uh, can advise of any upper limit on how much the government will pay in taxpayers' dollars to get a deal with the Nationals. It's not about emissions policy. It's not about the history of the Labor Party. It is about how much this Finance Minister is willing to spend the taxpayers' money on getting this deal. Senator Wong, you have brought the Minister's attention back to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. In relation to how much we invest, let me make this bold prediction, Mr. President. Let me make this bold prediction. When we outline plans to invest in regional communities across Australia, I bet Order. those opposite will support every dollar of that investment. I bet they won't be going to the go to the next election saying Order. they're withdrawing any of that investment. Oh. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, direct relevance. We accept, I think Senator Ryan said, if there's a glance, glancing blow or something like that about other parties' policies, we accept that. He's been asked whether there's any limit. Is there an upper limit on how much he will spend? He's talking about us. It cannot, po Sen it cannot possibly be directly Senator relevant Wong. with respect. The, the minister was addressing the substance of the question. I will bring the minister back to the question again. However, minister, you have minister order, order, minister. You have 11 seconds. Mr. Mr. President, as always, we will do what is necessary to protect the jobs, the security, the prosperity of Australians. We will make sure we invest where necessary for the benefits of Time Australians for, the for their future. Time for the has expired. Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr, Order, Mr. President. Perhaps the Finance Minister can assist us with this, but is there any provision in the budget for this deal? Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Mr President, there are indeed many billions of dollars in the budget that we are investing already in emissions reduction activities, that we are investing already in supporting regional growth activities. I need only point you to the investments in our Agriculture 2030 agenda, uh, to the investments in our modern manufacturing agenda, uh, to the investments indeed in other aspects of our regional growth agenda, Order to the investments we're making in terms of meeting the stretch Order. goals and targets Senator in relation to emissions Senator reductions, Gallagher. investments in terms of hydrogen hubs, seven of them that we are committed to establishing right across the country. Uh, to investments that we are making in terms of driving new carbon storage opportunities, to the investments we are making in terms of Snowy 2.0, which, if I look just down the road, happens to be in a regional part of Australia. Regional investment delivering lower emissions environment that will support lower electricity prices in the future. 
That is indeed what we will continue to invest in and pursue. Senator lower emissions, Birmingham, more jobs, lower electricity for the prices. The answer has expired. We will now return to Senator Lambie. Hopefully, we have a better connection. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President, and once again, congratulations. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbert. One, when the Prime Minister shut down the country in March 2020, he promised Australians that we would use the time wisely and get ourselves ready before we had an outbreak. He told us we would make sure our hospital systems could cope with COVID before it got out into the community. It's been 18 months, but Premier Gutwin says Tasmania's hospitals still aren't ready. Since COVID arrived in Australia, oh. to Tasmanian hospitals to make sure that they are safe, so that we can reopen. Your question did break up slightly, but I believe the minister probably got the majority of it. Um, minister, are you happy to proceed? <laughs> Thank you. Order on my left. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thanks, Senator Lambie, for the question. I did miss a piece which was a quote from the Premier, but, uh, Mr. Premier, uh, I would like to assure all Australians that the work that we've been doing since the beginning of the, of the COVID-19 pan pandemic has been to support Australians and to protect Australians uh, as we work our way through the impacts of the pandemic. And Mr. President, that includes for the health system, and one of the first things that we put in place was the private hospitals agreement, which allowed us to have access to the private hospital system, should we need it, to support the public health system to cope with the pandemic, Mr. President. And in the period of um, uh, the pandemic so far, the Australian government has provided over $6.6 billion in funding for the direct costs of diagnosis and treating of COVID-19 and the broader, broader public health costs for contact tracing, outbreak management and vaccination, Mr. President. We continue to support uh, Australians with respect to uh, the management of COVID and also uh, maintaining their health. The, the National, COVID, National Partnership on COVID-19 response is in place until the 30th of June 2022. It was agreed by Order. all jurisdictions, Mr. President, and the Commonwealth is covering 50 per cent of the additional costs incurred by state and territory public, hospital, uh, public health and hospital systems on responding to COVID-19 outbreaks. Mr. President, this funding, this funding Mr. President, is demand-driven and there is no cap on funding, Mr. President. Uh, in the context of reopening, Mr. President, all states have indicated that they have adequate capacity to meet demand based on the Dowding model modelling and supplemented by their own modelling. So when we get through the 70 and 80 per cent fully Order. vaccinated rates as the basis for reopening, based on the Doherty modelling, Mr. President, uh, and those are the discussions that we're having with the states and the territories. Just before we go back to Senator Lambie, I, I just would remind all senators, and dis, uh, interjections are always disorderly, but particularly when we have remote questions, it is courteous to the asker of the question that they be able to hear the answer. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Minister, could you please explain to why other Australians why Tasmania won't open until it hits 90 per cent? And can you clarify it's because your government has not put a cent into Tasmanian hospitals like it promised when COVID hit? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It's good of Senator Lambie to ask me the question and then answer it for me. Um, but I would disagree with her question and I would disagree with her answer, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the reason that Tasmania is not going to open uh, until it reaches 90 per cent vaccination rate is a matter for the Order. Tasmanian uh, Tasmanian government, Mr. President. That it's purely a matter for the Tasmanian government. It is that it is their decision, Mr. President. I would hope, Mr. President, Senator that Eggs. the Tasmanian government does what's happening in another, a number of other jurisdictions and follow the national plan, uh, supported by the Doherty modelling, uh, in support of Australians being able to move uh, freely around the country uh, and get back to contact with their families, Mr President. That's what National Cabinet agreed. That was the process uh, and that was the rationale behind getting the, the Doherty modelling done in the first place. At what point in time could we safely 
reopen at what level of vaccination rate could we start to re safely reopen the uh, Australian community? Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, has Tasmania has Tasmania received extra money for our public health system in the last 18 months because of COVID? It's as simple as that. Yes or no? Minister. Mr President, as I said in response to Senator Lambie's first question, uh, through the National Partnership in COVID Response, which is in place until 20. 30, uh, the 30th of June 2022, which was agreed by all jurisdictions, mm. the Commonwealth is covering 50 per cent of the, any additional costs incurred by any state or territory public health and hospital system in responding to COVID-19 outbreaks. The funding is demand-driven and there is no cap on it, Mr President. Through the partnership, the Australian Government has provided over $6.6 .6 billion to any state or territory where there has been additional costs in, for the direct costs of diagnosing and treating COVID-19 and for the broader public health costs for contact tracing, outbreak management and vaccination, Mr President. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, okay. I'll just uh, wait a moment while the Chamber clears slightly. Oh, are you on your feet, Senator? Are there any? Take note of answers, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator McKenzie to the question asked by Senator O'Neill. Madam Deputy President, I quote, we should reject net zero because it's bad for Australia, bad for our national interest, and it's going to do nothing to help the environment. Net zero emissions would just make us weaker. Those are the words from Senator Matt Canavan, a member of this Morrison-Joyce government, who along with an alarming number of allies, has come to Canberra this week with the sole intention of scuttling the coalition's long overdue backflip on climate policy. This has become an insurmountable political problem for Mr. Morrison, himself no stranger to climate denialism antics, and it's a problem that encapsulates the inherent backwardness of this tired, eight-year-long Liberal national government. This Prime Minister won't hold the hose, mate but he'll hold up a piece of coal in the House of Representatives as a cheap stunt. His sudden U-turn on climate change is what this country has come to expect from a prime minister whose ambition for this country goes no further than his own job title. There is none so pious, Madam Deputy President, as the new convert. And I'm sure we will soon see many of these agitators over there in the Nationals soon towing the party line once they secure whatever off-budget, pork-barreling grant they've got their eyes on. But what is particularly galling is to hear from those op opposite is their breathless claim that they, and only they, are the true defenders of rural and regional Australia. This might come as a shock. But the views of the nationals are not reflected in their communities. Rural and regional Australians, alongside the business sector and faith communities, are in fact leading the charge on climate action. And they do this because they accept the overwhelming evidence, scientific evidence, and acknowledge the immense social and economic benefit to reform. The Courier Mail today writes about the work of businesses, schools and community groups from regional Queensland, particularly Biloela and Wide Bay, who are using renewable energy and recycling to go green. In particular, I note the work of the Catholic Diocese of Rockhampton, which has installed solar panels and batteries on a number of their schools, including Shalom College in Bundaberg. These schools are reportedly some of the first in Australia 
to have achieved 100% renewable energy. And their actions show not only a commitment to reducing climate emissions, but a devotion to their teachings of their Catholic faith. In his 2015 encyclical, Laudato Si, on care of our common home, Pope Francis said, climate change is a global problem with grave implications, environmental, social, economic, political, and for the distribution of goods. It represents one of the principal challenges to the facing humanity today. And the Pope goes on to call on followers to, quote, bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable, and integral development. The Pope questioned, how can anyone claim to be building a better future without thinking of the environmental crisis? It's perplexing that the Catholic churches and the schools in Senator, Senator Canavan's own diocese are increasingly powered by renewable energy, an act that is once at once aligned with the church's teachings and yet somehow diametrically opposed to the senator's own views. I am immensely proud as an Australian and as a Catholic that my church has led on the front of this issue. And I, like many Australians, am deeply disappointed by the sideshow occurring in Canberra this week as the warring wings, the Nationals and the Liberals and the Morrison-Joyce government focus on themselves rather than on the issues impacting ordinary Australians. Net zero by 2050 is not a craze, it is not a fad, nor is it some vast conspiracy theory. It is the upside to proper action on climate change. It is indisputable and it is a position that is broadly accepted by large swathes of the community, including faith communities, the business sector and rural and regional Australians. We've heard senators opposite posture and argue about who represents rural and regional Australians while arguing against the very same policies that those communities are crying out for. Thank you, I Senator suggest Keneally. they read today's Courier Mail. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And as a Catholic and a member of this government, I'm immensely proud of what this government is doing to lower emissions. Those opposite don't seem to pay any attention to the real facts of what's going on here. So I think it's time to, to tell them a little bit what's, what we've been doing. Australia's emissions are at their lowest levels since records began. Emissions in 2020 were more than 20 per cent lower than at the 2005 baseline being used for the Paris Agreement. Australia has reduced our emissions faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and Senator Keneally's previous home, the USA. Australia is on track to beat our 2030 Paris target, and we will meet and beat that target. Let me repeat that again. We will meet and beat that target. On a per-person per basis, that's a reduction of 48, nearly 49 per cent per, per capita. This is more than France, Germany, Canada, New Zealand and Japan are expected to achieve. Now, those opposite haven't even set a 2030 target that they'll share with anyone, so God knows what they're carrying on about. Our approach to reducing emissions is not going to be theirs, which we know is going to be taxes. As we know, the world's changing and we're going to need different mixes of energy. Our customers are telling that from all around the world, Japan and Korea. So we're developing the technology to meet those, um, those challenges. And Australia is truly the envy of the world on this. It is, we have the strong targets, we're beating our targets. We're spending $1.2 billion on hydrogen development. We will get hydrogen well below the $2 per kilo mark that is expected. And that is both blue and green hydrogen. But these things take time. These things aren't going to happen overnight. Like, like carbon capture and storage, these are technologies that need to be developed. Now, we know that those opposite won't take any time to develop a tax on this. They'll apply it the second they ever get back into government. It's just a shame that they won't ever learn their lessons. Hopefully they learnt their lessons from the last election. So we are Australia's building wind and solar three times faster than Europe or the USA on a per capita basis. We have the world's highest take up of rooftop solar, with one in four homes uh, having, now having rooftop, rooftop panels. Last year, seven gigawatts of rooftops of solar power 
was installed in Australia. Seven gigawatts. It took 30 years to, to come up with the first gigawatt of power, of renewable power. Now we're doing seven gigawatts a year. Globally, we're doing, I believe, the number is 700 gigawatts. So we're doing our fair share, and we're committed to reducing emissions through technology, not taxes. Our technology investment roadmap will support investments in hydrogen, long-duration energy storage, uh, um, pumped hydro, low-emission steel, low-emissions aluminium, carbon capture and storage, and healthy soils. And this will guide $80 billion of um, this will, our commitments and investments in this will guide and, and enhance, will be enhanced by $80 billion of private investment going along at, with ours by 2030. And that will support 160,000 jobs. So Australia has achieved its, its emissions reduction. And when you look at it on a per capita basis, we're doing far more than they, we would, those opposite would ever have achieved. And Senator Keneally you know, says we're an eight-year-old tired government. Well, let me just remind you of a few things we've done in the last six weeks, six weeks since we were last sitting in this place. So five million Australians have received their first dose of COVID, while 6.5 have received their second dose. First million doses of Moderna have arrived and have been put in the arms of those aged 12 or more. We have secured access to 300,000 doses of Molnu Peravir, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. We have cre created, and it might have been missed by those opposite, but we created a, an enhanced security partnership, AUKUS, with the US and the UK. There was the first historic meeting of the Quad. Uh, the, final but, uh, the, um, uh, the final budget outcome for 2021 shows a net improvement in the na nation's finances of $80 billion. Hardly the hallmarks of a tired government. And I can keep going if you would give me leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Senator Deputy Bank. President. Uh, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, again today we saw the rabble that is this coalition government on full display in question time. Uh, over the last 24 hours, we've seen an increasing in backgrounding from Liberals on Nationals, from Nationals on Liberals, from Nationals on Nationals, from Liberals on Liberals. Around and round it goes, just like it has for the la last eight long years. And most recently, uh, we've had Senator McKenzie only yesterday in question time saying that the National Party is the only party standing up for the regions. And then we've got Liberal Senator, Senator Holly Hughes out pointing out that the Liberal Party represents more seats uh, in rural and regional areas than the National Party. Is it any wonder that this government, after eight long years, has been unable to come up with a policy on one of the biggest challenges facing our country and the world that will determine whether we get jobs and opportunities in regional areas of this country or whether they be sent overseas. The reason they can't come to a conclusion about this and, and make sure that they are putting regions first, that they are putting jobs first, that they are putting the environment first is because they are so hopelessly divided and want to spend their entire time chucking bombs at each other rather than actually working together in the interests of the country. We, day after day, we see this ongoing infighting uh, which is holding our regions and holding the country back. What we also learned in question time today is that this whole farce of the National Party pretending to fight for the regions is just that. It is a pantomime. And Senator Davey knows it. She's sitting there. She knows in her heart that it is, she is a, a, a part, playing a role in a pantomime, just as Barnaby Joyce, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, is, just as Senator Mackenzie is, because they all know that for whatever they might be saying and for whatever crocodile tears they might be crying, for whatever protest they might be putting up and claims they're making about the regions, this has all been decided by a Liberal Prime Minister from Sydney being Scott Morris. Now, Scott Morrison has basically said that whatever the National Party room might actually think or do or call for, it's completely irrelevant, just like everything the National Party does in this chamber, utterly irrelevant 
full of posturing, full of bluster, full of infighting, but never actually delivering to the regions. What the Prime Minister has said is that it will be a decision of the Cabinet as to whether this country uh, commits to net zero Senator emissions Day. in 2050. It's not, a member for the Na it's not a matter for the National Party room. And whatever bleating they might carry on about and whatever false protestations they might put up about caring for the regions, this Prime Minister from Sydney does not give a toss. He is going to push on with net zero emissions because he knows that all the Liberals are backing him on it uh, and he knows that the country is, that's what the country wants. So this is just a big, long saga. It is longer than a Shakespearean tragedy, what we are watching unfold in this parliament, because we all know where it's going to end up, which is that the Prime Minister gets a deal for 2050 and the Nationals pretend to claim them, themselves as heroes. But what we can be 100 per cent sure of is that whatever plan this Prime Minister comes up with will be exactly what he is, and that is a big, fake. We have a fake for a Prime Minister. We have a marketing man who completely lacks substance. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the plan that the Prime Minister is going to take to uh, Glasgow is also going to be a big fake plan. It's not going to be legislated. So he's already said that whatever target he sets is not going to be set by legislation. So there'll be no penalty for breaching it. There'll be no way of enforcing it. It's going to be full of outs and exits and turnarounds and roundabouts and caveats to keep Barnaby Joyce happy. Uh, because if, you can, if Barnaby Joyce is involved in settling a deal on climate change, you can bet that it is not worth a cent. It is not worth the paper it's written on. This is going to be a fake plan from a fake Prime Minister leading a fake government that has done nothing about this and many other issues for eight years' time. And if you don't believe me that this is going to be a fake plan, full of buzzwords, full of nonsense, full of meaningless statements that won't actually do anything, listen to Senator Cadavan. Because Senator Cadavan came out after the coalition party room today and it's reported that what he had to say was that how many times have we heard this latest catchphrase out of the focus groups delivered by the Prime Minister that they're about technology, not taxes. Every senator from the Liberal Party has rabbited on about it. Technology, not taxes. Well, Senator Canavan has called them out. He said that that is just a slogan. It is too good to be true. It is like rainbows and puppies. It is nonsense. It means nothing, you, just senator like Watt. their fake plan. Uh, and I do remind you to refer to those in that other place by their correct titles. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And it is always a pleasure to rise in this place and talk about who in this chamber best represents the interests and best delivers for regional Australia. And it is the government members on this side of the chamber that are delivering for regional Australia and in particular for regional Tasmania. Um, one of my greatest joys as a senator for Tasmania is representing our great regions. And as the duty senator for the seat of Lyons, I have um, a wonderful opportunity to get out and see the best of our state and see how our government is investing in regional Tasmania to ensure that our communities uh, remain strong. Just last week, I was up at Corrumbeen Care in the beautiful Derwent Valley. They uh, have received uh, $3.7 million in funding under the Building Better Regions Fund to uh, deliver a community health and wellbeing hub, repurposing existing buildings that are at Willow Court. This is much needed infrastructure uh, in the local community to support the health and wellbeing of all of those in the Derwent Valley and beyond. And I'm very glad that our government is delivering um, on, on this important project. $100 million our government has committed for irrigation projects, which are so needed across regional Tasmania so that our agriculture industry can continue to thrive and prosper. Growing up in Tasmania and spending so much time uh, driving along the Midland Highway up from the south to the north of the state, you can see the transformative effect that our irrigation schemes have had in regional Tasmania in ensuring um, that our, our farms are, are green and are growing um, food to supply the nation. Um, we've provided millions in financial relief to tourism businesses that have been impacted Senator by. Yes, Senator. I do remind you that taking note was answers given by Senator McKenzie to questions asked by Senator O'Neill. So, I have listened carefully, uh, and you've strayed uh, way beyond the question. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Deputy President. Look, I will turn my remarks now um, beyond just our government's broader investment in regional Tasmania to look at how we are uh, working within the regions to ensure 
that Tasmania plays its part to reduce emissions and, uh, and that we are good custodians of the environment, because the government um, is progressing the Battery of the Nation plans with the Tasmanian government um, to increase, increase the interconnection between Tasmania's energy market, which is, will be underpinned by an abundance of clean, reliable hydropower supported by newer wind developments and the rest of the national energy market. And I hear time and time again just how necessary this investment is in the regions. And uh, in hydro um, electricity in Tasmania to ensure that we have jobs for the future um, and also to ensure that we do our part in terms of uh, reducing emissions. Um, it often surprises me, Madam Deputy President, how pessimistic people can be about the world's capability of achieving a goal um, which is some years away. And when you look at the rate of advancement in science and technology over the last century, it seems to me that we should be very optimistic about what we can achieve by 2050. And as a government, as I have said, we are investing to support that innovation uh, here in Australia and particularly in regional Tasmania. Um, again, earlier this month, I was fortunate to be able to visit an incredible Tasmanian business, which was the recipient of a grant from the coalition government's commercialisation fund. Um, this fund supports projects within the government's six national manufacturing priority areas, including food and beverage and recycling and clean energy, and supports businesses which have ideas to undertake commercialisation activities in R&D, uh, investing in technologies that will assist them to upscale their operations and secure further investment to expand both nationally and internationally. And sea forest based at Tribunna in the southeast of Tasmania is one of those businesses. They are doing world leading work uh, cultivating a particular species of seaweed, which, um, when added in small quantities to livestock feed, greatly reduces the amount of methane which is produced by those animals. And this has huge um, potential for our livestock industry in Australia and around the world because uh, not only does growing the seaweed help to absorb carbon in and of itself, the end product reduces the amount of methane going into the atmosphere from one of our key industries in Australia. And it was incredibly exciting to see the work um, that the team are doing at Sea Forest and how, with the support of this government, this government that invests in the regions, that has a plan, uh, that they are working to take that idea of, as a commercial product to the industry. Um, and if and when they take that next step, they'll be able to add significantly to their 40 strong workforce in a regional town which really needs jobs and career opportunities. So that is just one example of the thousands of businesses around Australia in the regions who are innovating here and now into 20, in 2021 to create jobs and reduce our emissions. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, Senator Hughes said yesterday it's a misnomer to assume that it is only the National Party that represents the voice of rural and regional Australians. Well, Senator Mackenzie called her the member for Woolloomooloo during the course of this afternoon's proceedings. So that's going well. That's going well. Well, the truth is, Senator Hughes is right. Mr Joyce, who, heaven help us, is the Deputy Prime Minister, said the National Party represents the poorest electorates in the country. Claim checks out. ABC fact checks checked it twice. It's absolutely correct. There is a relationship between National Party representation and poverty. The relationship is not a, not a casual relationship. It's a causal relationship. A hundred years of National Party representation of some of these seats has delivered a century of impoverishment. If you vote national, it's a very predictable result. You vote national, manufacturing jobs go offshore. If you vote national, public services get privatised. If you vote national, your health services get cut if you're in a country town. If you vote national, your TAFE gets closed down and 150,000 apprentices disappear. If you vote national, the dairy industry disappears. If you vote national, indeed, in New South Wales, your Murray-Darling Basin water disappears to spivs and speculators. The National Party representatives deliver social misery, unemployment and impoverishment. It turns out today the Auditor-General said half of the regional grants, you know where half of the regional grants money got spent? In the big cities. In the big cities. The Prime Minister, for all the positioning, 
all the pantomime, the look behind you action that's going on, all the briefing, all the carry on, the Prime Minister's got this figured out. The Nationals are irrelevant. It's going to be a Cabinet decision. Senator Mackenzie said today, we're going through our own internal processes. Well, that's what they do best, go through their own internal processes. Go through their own internal processes, endlessly, endlessly self-absorbed. Mr Littleproud said, we've only had four hours to consider this, when I mean, they've had more than 70,000 hours. It took less time to put a man on the moon that it's taken the National Party to figure out what they're doing about industrial development and clean technology in the regions. But for all of the action in here, all of Senator Mackenzie's pantomime and carry on, well, don't worry about it, Senator Mackenzie. The Prime Minister's got it figured out. If the National Party really stood up for regional Australia, there'd be two things that had happened. First of all, they would have spent eight years figuring out a policy framework that delivers jobs, that lowers emissions and drives down electricity prices. That's what they would have done. Now, the Prime Minister said, if you have a go, you'll get a go. Well, what happens if you have 21 goes? What happens if you have 21 goes? That's how many goes this Prime Minister's had. And the National Party's had no impact, no impact on this area of policy. I'll tell you what the second thing is that you'd do if you were the National Party and you were really going to stand up for the regions. You'd grow a backbone. You'd get serious. You'd really mobilise. You know, when former Prime Minister Hawke and former Treasurer Keating decided that Australia shouldn't own a national airline anymore, a significant momentous decision in the history of public ownership in Australia. You know what they did? They had a national conference of the Labor Party. They took the debate on, they provided leadership, and the wings of the Labor movement came together and thrashed it out and got a result. What do you see from this lot? Backgrounding, whinging, whimpering, crying, moaning about each other? There's no courage, there's no fight, there's no struggle, there's no spine, there's no back down, there is no capacity for this quizzling political party to represent regional Australians Thank if you, there Senator ever Ayers. was. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator um, Hanson Young, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to my questions today relating to the Prime Minister's lack of ambition uh, and uh, ability to take strong 2030 targets to the Glasgow COP26 conference uh, in the next two weeks. This government is spending hours and hours, days and days this week, pretending that they care two hoops about cutting pollution in this country, while we've got the Prime Minister begging the National Party to allow him and his government to agree to net zero by 2050. On one hand. On the other hand, he's standing out in question time today over in the other place, boasting about the fact that his government is overseeing the biggest expansion of gas that this country has ever seen, talking out both sides of his mouth. And it's clear to every, for everybody to see. And the EU and the rest of the world is watching on in horror as we have the Prime Minister parading around, pretending as though net zero by 2050 is some big goal. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is trying to work out how we cut pollution in the next decade because that's what the science requires. This Prime Minister is gloating about the fact that he is opening up new coal mines, new gas fields, 
and at the same time trying to pretend that he cares about cutting pollution. Well, the International Energy Agency has made it very, very clear. We will not reach net zero if one single new coal, gas or oil project is developed. That's the facts. That's the expertise. That's the advice. And yet we have a Prime Minister who is whimpering in the wings and trying to pretend that everything is A-OK. -okay. What a spiv. What a fraud. What a pretense of a leader we have in Mr Morrison when it comes to climate action and cutting pollution. We know, of course, that here in a Parliament this week we have the right-wing rump of this government uh, holding up any action. And so while the Prime Minister is handing, ready to hand out big amounts of cash to the National Party, not a slush fund uh, that they can ever uh, turn down on that side of the government, rort after rort after rort, and on the other hand continuing to allow coal and gas in this country to let rip. What an embarrassment of a plan to take to the international community and to the stage when it comes to the, the Glasgow conference in two weeks' time. The Prime Minister's net zero promise is a fraud with his expansion of new coal and gas. It's a spiv of a plan and it's going to fry the planet. And I know Senator uh, Nick McKim would also like to contribute to what a fraud this Prime Minister is. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. President. We are facing ecological collapse and the climate is literally breaking down around us. Yet in one of the greatest shakedowns in Australian political history, the National Party are using this existential crisis to stick out their collective hands for billions of dollars of public money in order to support a shift in rhetoric around a 2050 target. Now, this is not only grifting of the highest order, it completely misses the point because the science is abundantly clear. We need to act now. We need targets for 2030, not 2050. And most importantly, we need to ensure that no more new coal is extracted, exported and burned. We need to make sure there are no new gas projects to extract, export and burn gas, which is just as damaging in climate terms as coal. And we also need to make sure that we stop strip mining our native forests in this country, emitting vast amounts of carbon and destroying precious habitats for our threatened species. Those are the things that we should be focused on, not a meaningless, distracting debate around a 2050 target. And we need the Labor Party to focus on 2030. We need the government to focus on 2030. We need the media to focus on 2030, because this is Senator the critical McKim, decade. Your time has expired. The question is that the motion from Senator Hanson Young uh, to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. We now move to. Uh, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day?